नमस्ते सर सो वी आर लाइव इन द फेसबुक पेज ऑल्सो सो वील स्टार्ट बाई वन मिनिट तो रोहन आर यू देयर रोहन आर यू देयर हेलो यस एंड ओके सो रिकॉर्डिंग स्टार्टेड यस रिकॉर्डिंग हैज स्टार्टेड एंड आल्सो यू आर लाइव इन फेसबुक यस वी आर लाइव ओके सो गुड इवनिंग uh respected delegates so we are now today on the fourth day of our observ observance of national pharmacovigilance week and we are really fortunate that today we have uh professor usharani pingali madam from nijam institute of nijam institute and she is a join in the field of clinical pharmacology so she she will share the session with our own professor shantanu kumar tripathi sir who is also another join in the field of clinical pharmacology and we all know him very well and uh, with that may i request uh, tripathi sir and usharani madam to introduce the subject of discussion today that is safer prescribing in elderly so over to you sir and over to madam thank you thank you dr shambhu and good evening everybody we are uh, this is the fourth day of our series cme series uh, week long activity that we have placed to celebrate the national pharmacovigilance week in india and uh, today our uh, topic of discussion is safer prescribing in the elderly and uh, the speaker is dr shogot sarkar who is a dm clinical pharmacology resident at school of tropical medicine kolkata and we are privileged and we are very fortunate to have uh, professor usha rani pingali who is uh, head of the department of clinical pharmacology at uh, uh, nidams institute hyderabad and uh, she is uh, a very experienced senior clinical pharmacologist in the country with a lot of uh, contribution in the discipline and uh, uh we, we we would be really privileged we will be really for, uh, benef benefiting by her participation in today's program and she has so kindly at a very late hour on our request she has responded and she has so kindly agreed to chair in today's session uh without uh, waiting further i would request professor usharani to please uh start the proceedings uh initially maybe saying a few words about this topic and then we can get into the technical session over to dr usha please thank you very much yeah yeah thank you dr shantanu and uh, thank you everybody for giving me this opportunity it's always a pleasure working with uh, dr shantanu and the team and i know this is a very very important uh, topic you know say for uh, prescribing in elderly because uh, as we know you uh, there are a lot of confounding factors which affect uh, the elderly uh, people and uh, you need to really look into adverse drug reactions drug interactions and uh, even the medications which you are giving to the elderly need to be monitored so i think this is a very important topic which you have taken and uh, looking forward to a fruitful interaction and over to you you can start the proceedings so dr shogot if you are ready you can okay okay sir start the okay. question please uh, thank you sir uh, so now we are in the uh, national pharmacovigilance week uh, that is from 17 to 23 september and uh, it is, i am very happy i am very happy that organizer choose me uh, for this session uh, today my session is regarding the safer prescribing in the elderly as madam told and sir already told this is a very important part because uh, elderly are the a different uh, they have a different criteria so we we physician should uh, very cautious uh, during their uh, treatment and during the prescription uh, so this is the safer prescribing in elderly uh, 
I am I am very sorry that I have used some uh, cartoon picture here, but this is uh, this is only for sir education purpose only, uh, with due respect to uh, them. Uh, this is only for the educational purpose. Uh, in this picture, we can see uh, this elderly people is uh, very much confused. So what uh, tablet or pill to be take after what? So this confusion is more increased if the patient is suffering from different type of dementia, that Alzheimer's or senile dementia or vascular dementia, etc. So this confusion uh, create different type of medication error. A different type of adverse drug reaction, etc. So the safer prescribing is elderly is a very, uh, uh, very important in the respect of the clinical practice. So these are my agenda. Uh, first introduction, then drug therapy challenges is elderly. What are the challenges we face? There are different pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic changes in elderly. The different disease state that affect the physiological changes. Principle of elderly prescription, uh, we use some case for this. Uh, stop and start criteria, I am very sorry, the stop is double P, stop and start, uh, start criteria. BRS criteria, anticholinergic burden scale, and the way how we can, we can prescribe rationally for them. And then conclusion. So uh, coming to the introduction part, Uh, pharmacotherapy for elderly, it is a very complex and riskier process because uh, there are a different uh, type of medication they use, different variety of medication, not only the allopathy, uh, but apart from this different indigenous medication, homeopathy, different type of medication they use. There are a different prescriber give their prescription for them. They have different comorbidities. So ultimately this uh, different problem comorbidities, medication, make these people in the more riskier part during the prescription. There are different physiological changes that is happening during aging process and different comorbidities they have also change their different organ function, likely liver and renal function. This all affect the drug handling. Their cognitive impairment, their functional difficulty and they mostly depend on the caregiver. So different type of compliance issue or medication error can be happen to them. Adverse drug reaction are mostly seen in elderly population that, that at a young age, age population group. And this is a serious public health problem. And different study shows that near about 50% of hospital OPD visit is due to drug related problem. And polypharmacy and inappropriate prescribing uh, due to their multiple comorbidities is a well-known risk factor for different type of ADRs. And this ultimately happen there, uh, this ultimately affect their clinical outcome. So what are the challenges we face? What are the challenges we face during prescribing? That is the atypical presentation of the illness. You know, the, for all disease, the most common presenting feature for elderly, they stop feeding, there is a confusion, they stop walking, become bedridden, like that. The specific feature for a particular disease, often absent, uh, say for pneumonia, that is carp, expectoration, that is, that is not seen, most, most often not seen in elderly, they present with the just fever and confusion, stop fitting like that. So atypical presentation of illness is a great challenge to physician to particular, uh, to reach the particular diagnosis. There are multiple medication system they use. They also use some self-medication uh, that is from their friend, from their relative and use those medication. This medication also affect their outcome multiple comorbidities. This elderly population suffer from the multiple comorbidities, uh, cardiovascular, CNS, osteoarthritis, the different type of comorbidities they have. So different type of medication they are taking. So there is a polypharmacy. 
there is a chance of drug drug interaction and adr due to this polypharmacy also due to their physiological changes they have a more susceptible to the uh, to have the different type of adverse event there are i have told earlier there have a different type of medication error this is because dementia from the patient fully dependent on the caregiver caregivers and their diminished vision hearing their cognitive impairment also was uh, this medication error poor adherence to the treatment uh, mostly due to the economical and psychological issue and then others uh, this is also uh, also a burden to uh, to we get that we cannot get a good outcome good therapeutic outcome different age related pharmacokinetic change that we'll discuss after that and lack of clinical trial data from elderly this is uh, a quite important part uh, because uh, during the clinical trial elderly population is normally not included uh, as a patient so uh, a data from direct that direct data from those people is often absent so mostly the treatment or drug that is given to the elderly uh, may be off label or ultimately this expanded indication for them so all these are challenges in the elderly people that uh, that become um, that uh, uh, that cause more susceptible for adr to them or it is a great challenge in prescribing now pharmacokinetic change in elderly we know the different type four type absorption distribution uh, elimination we will discuss all this first is absorption uh, there is reduced acid secretion so ph is quite elevated absorption surface is diminished for gastric and intestinal part there is a gastroparesis with aging so gastric emptying time is delayed that is slow and motility is also decrease and there is also reduced splanchnic circulation so ultimately all this phenomenon affect the drug absorption now come to the distribution they have the increased body fat and reduced muscle mass so those drug that is fat soluble is affected those drug in the uh, uh, soluble in the water is also affected because uh, and ultimately this affects the different type of loading dose and maintenance dose i am not going to the details fat soluble drug uh, may have the potential accumulation property just diazepam can be accumulated if we use continuously and they have decreased albumin concentration so free drug concentration can be increased for acidic drug that is for phenytoin and increase alpha 1 acid glycoprotein so the basic drug free drug concentration decrease we can uh, take as example for propanolol or quinine etc quinidine etc hepatic metabolism is also reduced mostly the phase 1 metabolism this is more slower in the adult but phase 2 is not changed uh, very much uh, liver mass is also decrease hepatic blood flow is also decrease so those drug have a uh, fast pass metabolism those drug metabolism is fully dependent on the liver can be hampered so they have a different type of it may be in a spectrum from the toxicity to uh, ineffectiveness it's depend on the drug in renal excretion renal blood flow and glomerular filtration rate is reduced with aging uh, we know elimination is correlated with the creatine uh, clearance and it reduces as the age progress as the lean body mass decreases so only the creatine level is not a good indicator so we must calculate the creatine clearance by cockrop gold formula there are another formula that is mdrt formula or ckdpi formula but mostly this formula is used and uh, it is it is wise that every elderly patient have a some renal problem we should think we should uh, we should take it as a rule of thumb because as their body mass is decreased so creatine is not a good indicator so for elderly population 
uh, estimation of the creatine clearance and the dose decision according to this creatine clearance is a good choice always. These are the different drugs, their clearance. Uh, it is given in the chart. It is an exhaustive list. I am not going into the details in that. Now, what are the pharmacodynamic changes that is seen in the Antarctic? This pharmacodynamic change is due to the receptor binding change, change in the receptor binding, the receptor number, and the downstream pathway is affected. So ultimately the drug action can be affected. For example, we see the decreased effect of beta adrenergic agent due to, due to the receptor and drug interaction problem. Secondly, Exaggerated CNS response is seen by the CNS inhibitor drug like benzodiazepines, small uh, opioid, etc. This is due to age-related decline in the CNS function. But for calcium channel blocker, there is no change. So uh, different class of drug have a different change in this pharmacodynamic, uh, pharmacodynamic property in this elderly age group. This is the different disease state and different physiological change that can affect the drug handling by this elderly population. If patient have a cardiac disease, there is a congestion and edema, so absorption, metabolism, clearance, all are decreased. If patient have a kidney disease or liver disease, then the uh, clearance and metabolism of those drugs are affected. So different diseases should be taken into consideration during the prescribing in elderly population. Now, uh, this is a very important part that is principle of elderly prescription. We use some case uh, to clarify this part. Principle one, less is more. That means less medicine is more beneficial. Keep the medication list short. Uh, during prescription, ask question to yourself that need of new medication. Is there any need? Whenever possible, stop medicine when there is no complaining indication. Now, we should prioritize the appropriate treatment. Patient may complain four, five, six uh, complaint. So we should prioritize the which complaint it must be, uh, must be attended and give treatment and then other can be subsided automatically. During treatment, physician must wait the risk benefit assessment of the particular drug he is prescribing. Everybody, we should remember the pain should be controlled during treatment. Otherwise, the compliance or adherence will be decreased. So under treatment, each under treatment should be avoided for pain systolic hypertension. Because this patient, mostly elderly patient is suffering from isolated systolic hypertension. And this is a most common, this is most important for stroke and heart disease. So it should not be undertreated. Anticoagulation during atrial fibrillation. So these five questions we must uh, keep in the mind during prescribing and the less is more less number of medication is more beneficial in terms of reduce ADR, drug drug interaction, et cetera. So now case, Mr. Dow, 83 years old, elderly, have a history of benign hyperplasia of the prostate and hypertension. After visiting his grandchildren, he developed a viral upper respiratory infection. He took over-the-counter cold remedy that contained phenylephrine and chlorpheniramyl mallet. He now visited doctor because he is unable to urinate. His blood pressure is now during office visit. This is 190 by 80. So what happened here? He have a viral infection and took phenylephrine and chlorpheniramyl. We know phenylephrine, the alpha agonist and chlorpheniramyl is H1 antagonist as well as it is an anti muscarinic property. So there is a urinary retention due to relaxation of the detrusor 
and constriction of the sphincter. And this phenylephrine ultimately cause his shooting up this BP level because it is a vasoconstrictor. So this elevated BP and this uh, urinary retention both is due to this drug. So it is a drug induced effect. Since the Mr. Roy have a history of benign hyperplasia and he have hypertension, his physician prescribed prazosin extended release five milligram. That is, we know this is peripherally acting alpha one adrenergic antagonist. So he used for dual benefit to control the hypertension, to control the urinary problem. Now, two days later, Mr. Roy unfortunately fall and he have a fracture. Now what happened? Here, the patient is suffering from orthostatic hypertension or postural hypertension. So he have a dizziness and fall and then, fact, then fracture. This is also due to this drug. Now, principle two, think drug before making a new diagnosis. When we encounter a new problem from a patient, we should think drug as a differential diagnosis. Then before we make a new diagnosis or give a new treatment. So we must consider the adverse drug reaction as the etiology of sign and symptom first, then a new diagnosis. We should remember the patient may take OTC drug, different type of supplement and different type of herbal. So a proper drug history is necessary. And when there is no indication of a drug or the drug is causing the ADR, we should deprescribe in terms of stop the drug or reduce the dose. So think about the drug before making a new diagnosis and prescribing a new drug. Now, for Mr. Dai, this is a prescribing casket we have seen. What happened? He took phenylephrine and chlorophenamine that caused urinary tension and hypertension. Then he is added prazosin, then fall. So it is a prescribing casket. If there is a proper drug history and the physician stop this phenylephrine first, then check the BP, it, it, it can be better here. So prescribing a new drug to treat a adverse drug reaction should be always discouraged. For this, a proper drug history should taken from each patient, including over-the-counter and herbal products. Uh, see this picture. If it is a just like a starting a medication only to reverse the medication related problem or a new symptom, we must be little more careful. Otherwise, this type of incidents happen. Now, Mr. Ra have a fracture. So he attend the emergency and he have excruciating pain. So doctor prescribed meperidine. This is a opioid analgesic and diazepam because he was very much anxious. After a few hours, he become confused and somnolent. What happened? Here, the, due to this symptom, the patient received diazepam as well as a opioid. So ultimately those two CNS inhibitory drug make him confused. He is in the delirium. This is also a drug induced effect. Principle three, say no. Avoid prescribing inappropriate drug, the BRS criteria. The BRS criteria, this is uh, developed first by in 1991 by uh, Mark H. BRS. The intention was to decrease inappropriate prescribing and adverse drug event and to identify medication or medication class that should be avoided in adulthood. In 2011, the American Geriatric Society began oversee this uh, criteria, bigger criteria, and updated periodically in every three years. These are the different type of drugs. There's an exhaustive list is there. 
uh, that should be avoided because they have a potentially dangerous for elderly population. And if we know about this list and when prescribing, if we cannot remember this, there's no problem. Just open and see, is this an appropriate track? If no, then back, step back. So this BS criteria can prevent a inappropriate drug prescribing to elderly that has a potential danger, uh, that is a potential harm to those population. This is few example. Uh, this is a guideline from the American Genetic Society. Uh, opioid and benzodiazepine or gabapentin uh, should not be used together. Uh, Timethoprine and sulfamethoxazole in patient though, who have the uh, decreased gluten clearance and also taking the AC inhibitor ERP should be avoided because we know timethoprine and sulfamethoxazole have a potassium sparring diuretic like properties. ACE2 receptor antagonist may be used patient with the dementia but not the patient with the delirium because the ACE2 just like hemotate, we say hemotate. Hemotatin is a H2 receptor antagonist, but it also have a H1 receptor antagonistic property. So it can increase the delirium. So we, we must have a caution. Uh, used with caution when recommending aspirin in elderly age group of more than 70 years old. There are different three trials, the most recent is aspirin, aspirin that says if patient have a more than 70 years, Think twice before prescribing aspirin because the chance of uh, hemorrhagic problem, related problem is more there for them. Avoid the use of SNRI. Those patients have a history of fall or fracture. And last one, sliding scale of insulin regimen have a more chance of hypoglycemia than that of fixed dose. Now come to the anticholinergic burden scale. Uh, in the right side, there is a chart we can see there is a score one, ABC score one for mild, two moderate and three for severe. Now, there are different type of drugs given in the list. When we prescribing or when we, when we reconciling a prescription, we should add this score. And if this score is three or more, we, we must uh, consider deprescribing and give a drug that have a lower anticholinergic burden. Otherwise, the problem may happen that is suffering, uh, that is suffered by the Mr. Rai in our case. Now, Mr. Rai, after his operation, he slowly recovered. He continued a, uh, some pain over the hip. So, uh, he is prescribed acetaminophen and low dose analgesic is also prescribed as a SOS basis. Uh, he also prescribed laxative if the patient have a opioid induced constipation. His delirium cleared off, clears off and after rehabilitation, she become okay. Before discharge, his medication list is carefully reviewed and medication reconciliation done. Now he is almost fine. Now principle four, start low and go slow. If we decide to prescribe a drug, we must use a start low go slow formula. Start one or two medication at a time for a particular indication. For example, if the patient have a hypertension, we can use one or two medication for him, but at a dose that should not reduce the PP that can cause orthostatic hypertension. So use the safer medication that do not have this type of potential. Second, start with the low dose. If in our in, in this example, Mr. Roy is prescribed Prajosin XL 5 mg. If here the prescription is started from the 2.5 mg, uh, this uh, this problem may be uh, maybe this problem is not arise. Monitor the response. Fix the endpoint, measure outcome. Fixed endpoint. What is our BP goal to be reached? Then we measure the outcome. If we reach that BP goal or not, then we increase the dose. We should monitor the anticipated adverse effect for prescribed drug, benefit, 
as well as ATR, both. Before increasing the dose or adding a drug to the regimen, we must see the adherence. Recently, all the guidelines, diabetes and for hypertension, clearly said when there is a, uh, there is, we not reaching the, our desired level, assess the adherence first, then increase dose or add a new drug. So assessing the adherence is a, is a, is a inevitable part during elderly prescription. Then we optimize the therapy. So ultimately, start low, go slow, but go, and stay low as far as possible when the drug have an optimal a beneficial effect without any ADR. Principle five, the increasing adherence. How we can increase the adherence? Uh, keep the medicine list short. Try once daily use medication. Encourage the use of pill box. Review the bottle of medication during assessing the adherence. There are a different type of adherence measuring scale also, like MARS scale. We can measure the adherence and counsel the patient accordingly. Write indication for medication on prescription. Uh, this, is, this is a rule, but uh, often we do not follow this. Patient do not know what medication it is and for which, what it is, he is taking it. If we counsel it properly, this green pill is for your hypertension, uh, maybe he will not miss it. Medication management program. Find out the cause of non-adherence. If we prescribe a uh, we prescribe a extravagant prescribing like that, it's a more costly drug, and patient have a financial issue. So he, they are additionally poor. So we should find out the cause of non-adherence, non psychological, or financial, or any other issue, and then we can we can take care of that part. If there is a poor adherence, no more drug, no more dose. Poor adherence, we should not increase the dose, we should not add any drug. First, we should uh, assess, assure and assess the adherence, then go further. Principle six, keep it simple. Prescription should be simple. Medication is short, we have discussed earlier. Use the fixed dose combination and once daily re regimen. Avoid measurement and dose calculation if possible. That is, uh, if the patient have to proactively measure his dose, then take calculate the dose, the adherence will be poor or medication it will be more. Avoid medicine that need to be reconstituted and preparing different type of formulation and special administration technique. That can be a problematic for elderly because they have a second hand, they have a, have a uh, vision, visual problem, etc. Principle seven, think twice about prevention. Rationality of primary prevention, we should think about. Because the patient age, different type of comorbidities, life expectancy and risks of a new ADR. We should balance risks and benefit before prescribing. Now, we, if we go through the guidelines, this lipid profile guideline, that is uh, national lipid elimination program guideline, or or uh, that is aspirin, aspirin use prophylaxis guideline, then this is quite different for elderly and for younger age group. So think twice about prevention. Principle eight, this is also a preventive tool, tool for right treatment, stop and start criteria. What is stop? This is screening tool of older people's prescription. And second is start tool, screening tool to alert to the right prescription. Now, if there, that is, uh, 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 we can say it's prescribing omission. That is the start criteria. That we must give a prescription, a drug to him, but we are not giving. This is given in the start criteria and what are the inappropriate medicine we should stop, we should not give. That is given the stop criteria. There are some example, aspirin use. If the patient have no coronary, cerebral and peripheral arterial disease, we should not use aspirin, stop criteria. 
calcium channel blocker. If the patient have a chronic constipation, we should not use. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patient, non-selective cardiovascular, better not to use. Aspirin and warfarin combination without any PPI or H2, or H2 receptor antagonist may cause upper GI bleeding. So we should be cautious. Aspirin to treat dizziness or dementia when there is a no clear diagnosis, we should avoid or there may be a problem. First generation antihistamine, benzodiazepines and opioid should be avoided those patients have a history of fall and dizziness. These are few examples for the start criteria. If the patient estimated glomerular filter standard is more than 45 and patient is suffering from the type 2 diabetes mellitus and we are not using metformin. So this is start criteria told you use metformin when patient is okay. Aspirin for secondary prevention we should use. This is the start criteria set. Statin therapy for primary prevention, we should use. So start criteria says what drug we should use and stop criteria says what drug we should not use. There are exhaustive example for that. If we alert uh, for these criteria and tools, uh, we can use the safe medicine for them. Principle line, this is also a preventive tool, medication reconciliation. This is comparing the patient medication order with all those medications that patient is now taking. There are five steps to do this medication reconciliation. First one, make a list of current medication and check the compliance. This is important, check the adherence. Make list for medication that we, we wish to prescribe. Then compare these two lists and make the decision. This decision making is in with respect to patient condition. This is medical, social, and financial. As we discussed earlier, this financial condition can reduce the adherence and recommend the change with strong clinical justification. And last, communicate the prescription with the care givers with proper counseling. That this medication for this purpose, this time you have to give like that. This proper counseling increased the adherence a lot. <clears throat> Deprescribing, this is also a preventive tool. By this, all these preventive tools, we can, we can reduce the prescribing error, we can detect the near miss, we can detect the drug-drug uh, drug interaction, etc. This is also by five step. Part, first, we should perform the medication reconciliation, then, Consider the overall risk of drug into self. Who is drug causing this type of particular harm? Then assess for eligibility to be discontinued. Say patient is taking antihypertensive amlodipine and patient have edema. So this is a not eligibility criteria to stop this drug. We can, we can make change we can make change with same class of drug which have a low potential to edema. So we must assess the eligibility if this drug can be discontinued or not. Prioritize medication for discontinuation. We should make a list, one, two, three, this medicine, we can discontinue. Now, which one should be first? So prioritize the medication which is discontinued and lastly, implement drug, implement drug discontinuation plan and monitor their different type of withdrawal effect, their patient improvement, patient good outcome, etc. So ultimately, what are the way of rational prescribing? These are the principle we have uh, go through the different type of challenges, their change. Now, how we give a rational prescription to them? Prescribe a new drug that have a clear indication. First, during diagnosis, we must think about a differential diagnosis that is a drug-induced disease or not. If it is drug-induced disease, so there is no need of new medication. We can deprescribe, we can reconcile, uh, we can change different, uh, we can change to different class of drug with the same benefit. 
and that reduce the ADR. Regular medication review, discuss and agree all changes with the patient. This is very important. If we if we if we give our prescription, or if we uh, if we write our prescription in each line with proper discussion with the patient or caregiver, this will increase the adherence and ultimately give the good outcome and benefit. Avoid treating adverse events. This is the same same I have told earlier. Stop any current drug that have no indication. As some author says dragectom. If possible, avoid drug that have a known deleterious effect that we have go through this BRS criteria. Use the recommended dose for elderly patient. If there is no recommendation like that, we can calculate by the EGFR and then give your dose. If the dose is more, reduce it when it is appropriate. Use simple drug regimen and use FTC. Use once daily formulation. Consider non-pharmacological treatment if appropriate. Say so patient is suffering, this elderly patient suffering from the gastroparesis, they are having a constipation problem. So just uh, proper non-pharmacological treatment, increase water, increase fiber is diet. Uh, working like that, we can change this uh, constipation habit without prescribing a drug. Limit the number of prescription for each patient. Do reconciliation. Uh, as the patient have a different multiple comorbidities, uh, they used to visit different physicians, so they have a different prescription. This, this different type of prescription can cause many, a multiple type of drug drug interaction and ADR. So reconciliation should be done in each care transition and it ultimately give uh, a, a, a concierge care a good list for the patient that he should take. So in conclusion, elderly are therapeutically unique because they have a different physiological change in their body during aging process. We must set an agenda during therapy, which particular disease we should prioritize to treat and then give treatment. We should prescribe the simple regimen. Always think about the drug-induced disease. Comfort and function is the most priorities. Pain, pain should be reduced, otherwise there is a compliance issue. So comfort and their daily function is the most priority part. Single trial trumps the population trial. It is, uh, if we use, if we, that is, that we can think like in short, that each elderly population have a unique behavior. So in the all indicated drug for those particular age group may not be fit for my patient. Outcome depends on the adherence and success depend on the trust. This is the ultimate. So proper behavior, proper counseling, and, 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 and uh, just hear from them. What is their complaint? What are the issues they feel? If they discuss it properly with the physician, it increase the trust and ultimately give the successful outcome. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is our OPD. Uh, here we usually do our clinical pharmacological consultation, reconciliation, deprescribing, different type of. This is my reference. Thank you. Thank you, Shogododa. So, may I request uh, Professor Usharani, Madam, and Professor Shantanu Kumar Tripathi, sir, to give yeah. their comments? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was very well presented, and you covered most of the aspects which were required for uh, um, safe to prescribing in the elderly. And uh, as we know, geriatric pharmacology is really picking up in a big way because. Uh, 
the lifespan of people have been increasing. Uh, so you, this is one of the latest branches in pharmacology as well as in medicine. And uh, you, because we know that the physical and the physiological changes affect uh, many of these parameters and uh, uh, pharmacogenomics or pharmacogenetics, maybe you can just add a word on that too. You've talked very well of pharmacodynamics, kinetic profiling and uh, the other things. So maybe because you know the right drug at the right dose for the elderly patients, you know, giving that is pretty challenging. Yes, so uh, especially the adverse drug reaction. So does the genetic profiling help in any way in reducing the adverse drug reaction? Just for completion sake, maybe you could add something on that. And uh, of course, the other things you very rightly discussed very much in detail with the specific case examples, which are pretty interesting. And uh, you know, the elderly patients, as you said, they get confused. So sometimes they may be even overdosing because they forget that they've taken a drug and then uh, they may try to take another drug that again leads to you know, adverse drug reactions and interactions. So I think uh, it's always better to have it supervised in such a patient uh, who may be in a confused state. So educating the person who is actually administering the dosing, the drugs is actually ex extremely important. So yeah, I think uh, very well presented and you've covered the most of the points. So what do you Dr. Shantanu? Thank you. Yeah, well, it's quite uh, nicely covered. Okay, all the aspects have been otherwise covered. Uh, I'm just, I would supplement a few issues. First of all, you have mentioned about uh, the vulnerability of the aged person. Okay, why they are vulnerable that you have nicely de described and explained. Uh, the fact that uh, an elderly person is also likely to suffer from a multiple chronic disease simultaneously that would necessitate uh, treatment seeking from different specialists, uh, generating multiple prescriptions, and the problem of trying to adhere to the multiple prescriptions or responding to those multiple prescriptions. This remains really a problem. One aspect I think you can add to this is, uh, I was just thinking that how an elderly person is different. One is altered physiology, Second is altered pharmacology, meaning thereby pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. Third is about altered philosophy, philosophy yes. of life, okay, attitude towards life. Okay, it, it varies in two extremes. One, uh, giving up, uh, not trying to get a remedy, uh, tendency to accept as it comes, Okay, not responding to the need to seek care. So there could be also a difference in treatment seeking. And that is made more complicated depending on the context. What is his position in the family? Okay. Uh, most of the elderly people, at least in Indian context, if we think of that they do not have the privilege of uh, economic freedom they do not have the, the benefit of okay, a good social and family uh, acceptance. So this is these also complicate the whole matter and they become dependent on others, not just economically, but also otherwise socially. So if a prescription needs to be refilled, Okay, they have to again depend on a more busy member of the family. Okay, and until then, and there are also other issues of affordability. Okay, but then even people who can well afford, even there, the opportunity of finding time. Okay, many a times the elderly person is not mobile. Okay and uh, remains mostly confined at home. So he or she will depend on somebody else in the family 
to get his prescription filled. Okay, so these are also issues that make things more complicated. So altogether, I call it an altered philosophy. So one P is physiology, second P is pharmacology, third P is philosophy. So all these three P's, okay, will will make the situation more difficult. Next, you have very nicely uh, mentioned about the different principles. Okay, almost I think you mentioned about ten principles. I was thinking whether we could try to make a kind of okay kind of mnemonics. Okay, so I was putting putting it like that. That LM LM stands for uh, less is more, as you mentioned. in the elderly we should try to be reductionist okay as minimum medicine as possible because a single old man or a woman needs to be treated for five different comorbidities simultaneously for each of them if you limit the number of medicines to the lowest even then it becomes around 10 medicines and for any given individual okay managing to take the 10 medicines appropriately rightly as advised is a challenge forget about the age not just the elderly even in a young adult taking 10 medicines in a day as per the prescription it becomes a challenge so less is more is extremely extremely important principle then you have rightly said that start low and go slow so the first principle i say lm principle lm less is more second principle is start low and go slow this is relating to the dose starting dose and dr shugoto i do not agree that the the example that you had given about prazosin so it's not a very good example because for prazosin the starting dose should not be more than say 0.5 mg or 1 mg okay in order to avoid orthostatic hypotension okay so not 5 mg the problem is available 1 mg tablet of prazosin not to speak of 5 mg i don't know whether 500 microgram exactly. prazosin is available it's not yes, available exactly. so it is Except only 5 mg tablet that is available but then if you open up any textbook of pharmacology you will find that in order to avoid fall and postural hypotension in the elderly the starting dose should should be limited to first dose be not more than 1 mg so uh, uh we should also stick to that Uh, how it could be made possible that's a different matter if it is not possible then better not to prescribe prazosin to an old man okay next is about so second was first was lm second was ls then is uh, your ss that is stop start stop is always remember s t o p p two p's are there t o p p and start so you have very rightly mentioned next is r c rc is reconcile reconciling is extremely important particularly because so many prescriptions and then the elderly is more likely to visit emergency room and visit hospitals hospital admission is likely to be more frequent in case of an elderly so each time there is a transition of care there is a possibility of errors medication errors so likelihood of medication error is much more in the elderly that's the reason why reconciliation is extremely extremely important in case of elderly so whenever there is a transition of care home to emergency room emergency room to uh, hospitalization hospitalization within the hospital also in the in patient ward so from icu to uh, the the uh, general bed general bed to uh, high dependency unit etc each time there is transition there is a possibility of error then i put it kiss keep it short and simple short is of course the number of the size of the prescription short and simple you have mentioned simple they well, keep it simple so kiss is kiss keep it short and simple the prescription should be short and simple 
so lm ls kis ssrc and then abcd a for adherence b for brs criteria c for cascade prescribing cascade should be avoided we should always try to see whether in order to uh, manage one problem you are prescribing a drug that can create a second problem which will require a third drug to be given so prescribing cascade and d for d prescribing so a b c d l m l s r c s s and kis so i try to make a simple this thing so that all these we can keep in mind otherwise it is very impressive i really enjoyed listening to the other it is otherwise a challenging topic okay and it is all the more important because uh, the number of elderly people is increasing every day and like pediatrics we are not fortunate to have geriatricians in the country so each and every prescribing physician practically should have enough at the proper attitude knowledge and skills to manage the health problems of the elderly citizen senior citizens of the country so with this i thank you profusely from the core, core of my heart and i thank professor usha to be with us this evening and uh, agreeing to be the chairperson and uh, has given his expert comments also so if there are any further questions i find there are good number of suggestions or comments in the chat box if there are questions dr shambho you can uh, guide the questions and dr shogato can try to address them uh yes sir so there is uh, there, was, uh, there, there was one one comment about the fdc professor parthote like yes. concerned about the fixed dose combinations as it makes adjustments of individual constituents difficult Excellent. also the names are no longer generic and becomes confusing exactly i accept it it is easier for patient and less pill burden what's the right balance yes dr shogoto you can comment on this exactly regarding sir. your views on the fdc fixed dose combinations exactly sir uh the for the elderly people uh, we we as a, as sir so as i have so told that is we must uh, make it a simple and make it a, a less number of pill uh, the fdc which is quite good here but obviously sir you are true that uh, for fdc we cannot change a particular drug dose Uh, if if a adr due to due to a, any component of the particular fdc we have to discard the whole dose there are different type of pros and cons of there obviously but uh, but uh, if the regimen is fixed uh, i just i want to say that if the patient is taking the amlodipine 5 and telmisartan 40 mg and his bp is well controlled then and his potassium is within normally his creatinine is good then we can uh, we can give that uh, amlodipine and telmisartan combination fdc so uh, obviously during the first treatment first uh, first dosing uh, fdc can be problematic we cannot adjust the dose but when this outcome our desired outcome is uh, achieved then we can uh, convert our different two or three uh, medicine to fdc we can yes i fully agree with that the only problem being that if it's a new patient because we've got lots of you know junior colleagues around here exactly when they are starting off on a new medicine should they for example diuretic and calcium channel blocker obviously diuretic and beta blockers exactly so should they so to my you know first year pgt should i be advising no use uh, hydrochlorothiazide separately so you can adjust the dose if need be exactly. and stop exactly. it so what is the message you are giving out sir Uh, for new starters for continuation of this you can carry on Obviously. but for new starters just that part i want to exactly sir uh, that part i want well, to tell let when... dr shogo let me let me comment here okay. on one hand we are saying that keep it small small size of the prescription the number should be as minimum as possible on the other hand in the name of or it is it, there might be a legitimate need also in order to improve adherence sometimes we take recourse to prescribing fdcs but then this becomes a little contradiction 
at the more you once you write an fdc the count of the medicine or the count of the formulation becomes one but practically that contains two or more medicines the more the number of medicines more is the chance of adverse drug drug interaction more is the challenge of tailoring the uh, therapy because if you have to adjust the dose of one out of the three members in the fixed dose combination formulation you are otherwise challenged there so simple advice would be uh, a very pertinent issue has been raised by uh, dr a simple advice would be as far as practicable don't prescribe fdc unless exactly. you are very much uh, compelled okay otherwise you find it is there is a huge problem in this particular elderly person regarding adherence so there you can try to but then you are taking the responsibility on your head that yes i am i knowing knowing fully well that there are difficulties chances of adverse drug drug interaction etc increasing by the prescribing of fdc consciously i am prescribing because there is a serious issue of non adherence okay so that balance is required i fully agree with dr ray that for younger prescriber they should try yes. to avoid prescribing fdcs so this is great and dr ray also had asked about another thing about apart from uh, stop start criteria and brs criteria if there are any other tool dr shogato has uh, described also in his presentation regarding that acb score anti cholinergic burden score okay if it is 3 or more whatever medicine the old man is receiving so if you can i if you can check that reconcile that with this acb score tool and these there are basically uh, the list of the medicines okay some of the medicines they are they have a high anticholinergic uh, activity so their score is individual medicine will have a score of 3 another group which have a score of 2 another group each individual member now if a person is having three medicines one from the first group one from the second group one from the third group the total score becomes 6 3 plus 2 plus 1 and this particular tool says that in a individual elderly person if his acb score is 3 or more you should be cautious okay they are more vulnerable to fall they are more vulnerable to delirium etc etc we all know about the anticholinergic uh, drugs what they can do to the elderly person so dryness etc everything so there are many complications that may arise so that has to and many drugs we know that they may not be frankly anti muscarinic but then they have anti muscarinic property so keeping that in mind this list has been prepared so that is a very useful list also uh, dr sambo over to dr sambo yes sir please yes sir dr Ray, yes uh, it's in the chat box uh, first of all dr shogoto sarkar i must congratulate you because uh, uh, for this very important uh, thank you and and for um, professor shantanu tripathi and our good friend shambo for raising this profile of elderly prescribing because i am also a member of the geriatric society of india and you see when uh, when we were you know doing our mbbs we had the pediatric focus and we had the adult focus nothing was there to subgroup adults into the senior adults and the you know middle age adults or the younger adults like our pgts so this entire focus on prescribing and pharmacogenetics as madam mentioned and pharmacodynamics is becoming more important because there is more people living longer more aging more pharmacotherapy but i just want to ask you two questions three questions here in the chat box one you run the clinic you showed us the picture do you give out pill boxes because my mother before she died was taking i think 13 medicines per day and you know she is also a medical retired professional but she was fed up in trying to tear these uh, these strips and bring them out and it would be a ritual of one hour every time because she would forget which one she's taking which one she's not taking and if this happened and you see none of us have the time to sit down with our parents or our children you know because we are all busy with our own selves or our smartphone so basically where does that elderly person go even if she is educated and all the new names of drugs are a problem trade name versus pharmacological name is another big issue i have i won't raise it here anyway my basic question is do you give out pill boxes to people who are not you do shambo yes, yes sir so oh. there is one concept known as brown bag concept oh. 
and uh, for that in from our clinical pharmacology opd actually professor shantanu kumar tripathi sir had uh, prepared one easy list how we can uh, actually give our patient the medication list and not only the medication list we need to also give the indication that means for this drug the patient uh, this drug is for this thing no, I'm, and, I'm referring to sorry to interrupt i'm referring to something very simple a person who has got class 5 education is being given a box which has got seven holes in okay, it okay i understand big yeah. enough that's yeah. the pill box i'm referring to the pharmacist department does the work and puts you know 10 pills in each box monday tuesday wednesday if it's alternate day or anti cancer therapy once a week or azathioprine or what methotrexate or whatever then it's only in one box they they don't need to remember anything else just Monday yes, box, yes. take all of it. Yes, sir. But the AM PM box has that been established? This, you are doing is, a very modern this job. This is commercially. This is commercially available in our uh, country also. But from our OPD, from our government setup, we cannot provide that. Uh, uh, th that is a problem, and there are some other issues also. Uh, because the in this pill box, some of our medic medicines, if we just strip off those medicine. the 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 condition the weather condition and there are some other influences which can uh, affect that pharmaceutical property of that particular drug so so right. yeah so so that that need to be uh, well prepared and i think we have uh, mr rohan tripathi also today here yes, and they had actually prepare one very good this type of box or we can say uh, uh made the, the name of that is made repar and what you had mentioning in that particular uh, box not only uh, they are uh, making that monday tuesday column but also in that box they are incorporating some alarm system and yes, uh, they are uh, the, that box is giving uh, some alert to the patient that now you have to take this medicine like that if uh, mr rohan is there uh, can you please explain a little bit what you are doing about the yes given a lecture i've heard it yeah, yeah. electronic system i've heard it yeah, yeah. electronic uh, system uh, i'm Hello? going for very cheap models very simple models which is you can roll out in college street middle college uh, tropical which is not costly but is because these boxes are available in amazon and all these places you know and all the pharmacists will have to do the work in laying them out they are watertight and they are airtight so there's no problem about and one tablet usually coming in physical contact with another one does not really contaminate from the best i know of liquid of course you can't give so one was the pill box so that's not really happening at the moment in in kolkata even in the private sector if that's what is right what i did was basically put them in uh, old fashioned brown envelopes and seal them for my parents i used to sit down and do them in 7 days i wrote this monday tuesday down so they knew what to take exactly when to take and i these i did for months as well when i used to go back and look after them in the terminal illness so that was one question so i would suggest pill box is considered or even it's a brown paper envelope but the pharmacy department will have to cooperate and do a lot of work this will really be important because i've seen eight people in their 80s struggling in my own family to complete the tablet this is real life story and i would be 80 in 25 years time i just imagine what it would be like for me then besides the philosophical aspect that uh, professor sipati talked about the second question is academic for the, the question being that the sarcopenia mm -hmm. and the fat content and the pharmacodynamics and the kinetics we used to study from lorenz's textbook long time ago you know what is the practical and the dose for elderly is not determined and i heard in your talk that you are not a advocate of weighing patients and all and at this moment of time i am actually having a few stroke patients with unknown body weight and i do not know how to advise them of what those are antibiotics they should be taking somebody says they may be 50 kg somebody says maybe 70 kg so you know there is a i don't want to cause side effects to giving the standard dose uh, to uh, i am a 91 year old patient with stroke currently under my care and i do not know the body weight so unless you measure the body weight at least once how will you have a handle on the dose of the drugs because it will definitely cause a side effect leaving aside the fat content and sarcopenia so your comments dr shorkar on that aspect of your statement 
please. Uh, so obviously, sir, it is it is quite uh, quite tough to assess during the clinical practice, but uh, we have some tools. Also, we have like, like that uh, this targeted concentration strategy. We have uh, we can use this strategy to to give a particular dose to a particular patient. I just want to clarify it. Uh, what are the dose given in the book? That is the population uh, for the particular age group population. First, use that. Then we assess his pharmacokinetic parameters, mostly clearance. Then we can reassess, we can, uh, we can readjust the dose and then give. This is target concentration strategy we can use for that. But it is quite difficult during the clinical practice. I just, uh, I really admit it. Yeah. On that team, perhaps Professor Tripathi will agree. Just having a simple weighing machine. I'm sure you weigh all your patients and take their height as part of BMI calculation and obesity. So that's easy. On the dose, again, if I may uh, take advice from Professor Tripathi, Japan never allows any Western dose to be administered to its patients. A new medicine called Opikapon has come. Contrary to Western literature, Japanese dose has been given according to Japanese population studies and they have rolled out. So all the Indian doses are based on Western literature. Neither is my gene similar to my neighbor. Uh, you know, so the entire discussion falls flat out there regarding the dose discussion and the ROC curve and the AUC curve and all the rest of things. So it's basically because we're having a scientific level discussion here, you know, and there are lots of juniors listening to us. So if I, we carry on the same old gossip, which is non-scientific based, there was no point in all of us sitting down together. At least we can give the leadership to our juniors to explore and build up because Japan is doing it. No drug is licensed in Japan unless it's uh, tested on their own population with regard to their own side effects, own dosage. So that's the dose theory of all the antibiotic and every antihypertensive, not built on our genotype. Sorry, sir, Dr. Tripathi, Professor Tripathi. Uh, this is, this is sir. extremely important consideration. Uh, thank you for raising this issue. Yes, you are very right that the uh, doses for the Indian patients are definitely going to be different. At least for certain drugs, it has been established. I remember during my younger days when uh, for the first time beta blockers came, propranolol, if you also remember, what was the huge uh, range of the uh, dose? It starts from, say, 40 milligram uh, to say 320 milligram uh, propranolol. And, uh, but then if you think of Indian population, most of our patients, they were uh, responding otherwise very good, not more than say 80 milligram. So uh, that day it is, it, is, it is very clear that, uh, and in India otherwise also, they're at the risk of underdosing many a times, but we tend to prescribe low dose mostly okay although it's it, it's very important suggestion and much needed it is time that we think about this and do something in india uh, india specific dosing and to establish that through experimentation uh, uh, it's great to know at least in japan they are uh, doing this more seriously oh, and they have the the part of their part of their drug rules uh, but then at least in India, that could be a, an agenda before the clinical pharmacologists in the country yes. that uh, at least to start with if for, for the more commonly used drugs uh, in India, if we could develop some kind of a formulary. So Indian yes. posology, we can call it. Posology yes. is yes. knowledge about drug doses, posology. So we can call it Indian posology or posology for the Indians. Uh, that would be, That is a good idea. Uh, we must do it. You also raised another question about that, whether the current uh, CBME, competency-based medical education curriculum in India, which has been introduced in 2019, whether that has mentioned about uh, elderly prescribing, the answer is an emphatic yes. It, it has been mentioned, elderly prescribing. Now it's up to we, the teachers, with how much seriousness we actually take this and uh, make them learn that it's not just like we say that uh, young children are not uh, tiny adults. Similarly, an elderly person is not just the, okay, just uh, uh, the, the variation or the version of a young adult. It's not like that. You have to think an elderly person, absolutely a different entity altogether who, who deserves to be treated separately, differently. 
so needs to be so from a scientific perspective the entire uh, like uh, and because it is not difficult because we have been treating pediatrics uh, a drug a drug uh, prescription as a specialty from time immemorial for the in india you know pediatricians had to calculate the dose uh, you bring out micro pipettes whereas adults used to be given any dose of drug you know without even checking the formulary but it, in elderly care there's a much more Uh, you know, um, um, uh, fragile, fragile biological system we are handling, exactly. like the pediatric age group, like Dr. Shogoto Shokar has said, with his ten agenda points. And you, so I like that adject adjective. I like that adjective, fragile uh, biology. But Bi biological Elderly. system, yes, like the pediatric. Yeah, yeah. That's true. It's That's absolutely true. On its way out, in a developing child is one, and it's a way a waning system. You know, it, it's basically in twilight years right. from all perspectives. Right. More importantly, right. you mentioned about underdosing. That's possibly defensive medicine. Yeah, because, defensive medicine, absolutely. Because you see, I take atorvastatin. I'm quite you know, happy to discuss my med. There's nothing special about me. So I take 80 milligram of atorvastatin. I have rarely seen in Calcutta or in India atorvastatin after stroke 10 milligram, 20 milligram. Recently, I'm yeah, seeing exactly. 40 milligram doses. Whereas you see, genotypically, I am same as your Mollik Bajar or your cholesterol patient. And I'm happily taking 80 milligram atorvastatin uh, with as it may be for 20, 15 years. Nothing happens. So the question is, if you give somebody like I've, this stroke patient is on 20 milligram okay. of atorvastatin. So we'll, so we'll have a sip. No, all I'm saying is that the drug dosages are not always lower. It can be needs to be higher. So we are under treating our patients, uh, going on no evidence. Absolutely, anyway, I agree. Thank you. I, I'll let yeah. other. people uh, ask the questions you. but thank you very yeah. much it's a wonderful course i'm attending thank you yeah. there is another comment is dr shotobrot singh sahu he has mentioned about rudas criteria rudas criteria is actually uh, it is ruda stands for roland universal dementia assessment scale because the elderly people are likely to suffer from dementia of varying Degree and range, not necessarily always that dementia is clinically diagnosed or clinically recognized, but some degree of forgetfulness is always is there with advancing age. So one can also apply that scale that suggested by Dr. Sotubroto, that Rudas criteria, Roland Universal Dementia Assessment Scale, and then uh, try to assess the vulnerability of that particular elderly person. to be uh, forgetful and uh, to be unable to actually adhere to the medications as desired so you can possibly to a certain extent predict the adherence or uh, suboptimal adherence by some elderly person okay by employing this uh, ruda scale uh, while prescribing itself and it's a very simple kind of scale okay uh, it hardly takes more than 5 minutes so one can one can try to get that score and uh, take special caution exercise special caution in uh, in ensuring that uh, the person elderly man is actually respond, uh, adhering to the prescribed medications so dr shambho is there any other chat box uh, question or comment which needs to be responded to no sir this was the uh, questions so Uh, apart from that everyone uh, congratulate our speakers and our chairpersons so another question by dr joydeep das uh, sir you are discouraging fdcs but sometimes at least uh, cannot the fdc reduce the pill burden so the so you have mentioned it i'm not discouraging neither i am encouraging i what i have said that it is always preferred not to take resort to fdcs unless it is we are in a compelling situation what is that compelling situation if we have reasons to believe that here is an old man who has a history of okay being non adherent so in that kind of a situation you can try to reduce the number of pills by prescribing fdc and there are other conditions also where uh, it becomes otherwise essential to use fdc if somebody is suffering from tuberculosis so many of the anti tb formulations these days are fdc only so but otherwise 
uh, we should not try to reduce the number just by just because of that because we remember always remember when you are prescribing fdc you are actually prescribing more than one medicine uh, we and you are making it appear as one medicine and fdc is not just one medicine it is more than one it is minimum two it may be more than two also so unnecessary use of fdc that is being discouraged okay unintelligent use of fdc is being discouraged okay go ahead next whether one, one strategy could be like that if initial one month or two months we we can use uh, separately different drugs and if we if we monitor them there is no side effects no ad, uh, adverse yes, effects yes, to yes. that particular drug that we said. can to to reduce the pill burden we can uh, prescribe yes, it yes. and often this is practiced also because lots of patient will tell after two to three months of taking three or four uh, antihypertensive drug and uh, then they will tell us that we need to so many drug please uh, do something so in that area we can prescribe uh, a fixed dose combination of antihypertensive drugs but what initial threat is like that if we try to start with fdcs uh, specifically as we are talking about just now talk about antihypertensive drug so there are lots of instances lots of uh, cases we found that uh, because one very common uh, fdc antihypertensive fdc we found a uh, combination of calcium channel blocker uh, uh, arb and some diuretic and that patient will end up with a hyponatremia because we know that very common in elderly population uh, uh, this type of dis electrolytemia is very common so we, we then we need to uh, reduce the uh, stop that fdc we can we, we start separately different drugs so instead of that if we can start in, in beginning if we can use different drugs uh, then if the patient is uh, well accustomed with those drugs then we can change to on fdc to reduce the pill burden that can be a strategy uh, i think Actually, some I just want to supplement one thing. Uh, if we if we go through the uh, as we are telling about the antihypertensive drugs, if we go through the uh, SCCHA guideline or the or ESC guideline, uh, they clearly told if we if we want to reduce the BP, systolic BP more than twenty, use the FDC from the beginning. Use the FDC from the beginning. They have told both in the guideline if we want to reduce the BP more than twenty. so it is it is depend on the patient it is as sir told it is depend on on the my my skill and responsibilities it's depend on the patient condition also yeah and that is that is the change that happened in the esc very recently changed esc guideline for managing uh, hypertension esc esh guideline and they 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 mentioned about or first time they told about the single pill combination drugs Exactly. Exactly. Who is ESC? Euro European Society of Cardiology. Why are we following European Society of Cardiology guidelines when we've got Professor Santana Tripathi out here? I'm a member of ESC. <laughs> Actually, sir, yeah, this yeah, is that... a whole example only, sir. Yeah. No, yeah, no, 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 no. Very important. Yeah. There are young and also, here. also, I'm a member of ESC. <laughs> Another ESC conference is going on in my second Zoom next, just on the second monitor. <laughs> so I'm asking so the must, question. we must take the spirit of dr rai's advice that we should be now time has come it has been long we have been uh, very blindly following the guidelines by the western people so it is high time that we just think of at least making our own indigenous guidelines okay i'm i'm not think of the laboratory parameters laboratory range the values so called normal values we should have our own normal values okay we do not have really I I do I'm I'm living in a East, uh, European Union for last twenty seven years. I've got nothing against it, but to avoid pill burden, you are reducing, right. you are increasing pills by two more. If that FDC exactly. was for three, so if a person right. with dementia is going to, you have given that person eight or nine tablets, like my mother was. Okay, so if she will forget, she will forget seven of the pills. So you have a risk factor in the patient. or the patient may may not want so many tablets so by introducing three different classes of drugs because drug interactions drug side effects which you will not be able to have any control over 
vis-a-vis -vis that person remembering two additional drugs or one additional drug. If you're having two FDCs in one prescription recipe for disaster, and in none of the hypertension guidelines is it given that you have to start with an FDC. I will check the European guidelines from my membership. You know, there is a risky situation. So I think the clear message, if I don't like FDCs, because I feel I'm losing control over my own prescribing. And what will I counsel a patient? I accept prescribing FDC has become a habit. Perhaps it's a bad habit. And unless the risk of severe forgetfulness compliance has to be weighed against what uh, challenges and harm I can do the patient, then I, I'm not prepared. Uh, Professor, to I, 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 Professor Rai, I take your advice. Uh, it is a very, very value, valued advice that number of FDC in a given in a given prescription may be taken as an indicator of patient safety. So I remember uh, WHO had developed a very simple uh, this thing model for assessing the rationality in a prescription, rational prescribing. And they have said while doing that for an ambulant patient, okay, who is attending a clinic and a given diagnosis, what is the average number of medicines prescribed? And they said that seven. it should not be more than three. It is somewhere, uh, it is 2.7, average number of uh, number of medicines. When they say average number of medicines, they are, it is, they are not meaning inclusion of any FDC. It is single medicine. So average number of medicines we prescribe to a patient, am, ambulant patient attending an OPD, for a single pathology or a single diagnosis should not be more than three. It is on an average, it is 2.7. Now there again, they have mentioned that the more the number of injections in a OPD patient, the more is the chance of more is risk, the risk is being compounded. Injections. When we are saying this, we are not against injections. If there is necessity, legitimate need of giving an injection, always give an injection. But unfortunately, Definitely, why this has come up? Because unnecessary injection. Similarly, if there is a legitimate need for giving FDC, always give an FDC. But the problem is concern is about unnecessary FDCs. Rational okay. FDC is okay. The iron okay. folic acid in pregnancy is okay. Vitamin D calcium combination for osteoporosis is okay. You know, those are rational combinations. But some uh, tricky antihypertensive combinations it uses rationality. That's what I am protecting. I'm nothing I against. Think, I think I think we uh, will take this, anyway. and I would request uh, Dr. Shambo and Dr. Shogoto to consider that if we can take say um, 30 prescriptions randomly, That's prescriptions it. to an elderly person, not just prescription. Uh, what Shambo, Dr. Shambo was telling about brown bag. That means a single individual elderly person. He might might be trying to adhere to. Uh, follow say, five prescriptions, get all those five prescriptions and see how many FDCs that old man is going to take and then follow them up that as compared to these, if there could be another cohort in whom another 30 prescriptions or 30 elderly people who are, what is the number of this thing? And then if you can do a subgroup analysis, those who are having say not more than one FDC and those who are having more than three FDCs how likely it is that the risk is proportionately increasing in those who are having three FDCs. The more the number of FDCs, the more is the chance of adverse drug-drug interactions. The more is the chance of inability to actually tailor the doses of individual drugs, okay? And the person with There is some network problem, yeah. sir. We we'll continue to take that uh, fault to uh, time to really come back to the physician. Yeah. So that is the issue. So let's let's see uh, if we can do some small exercise on this, and then I will get back to Doctor Ray again. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. It's fine. It's so, a it's a junior colleagues who need to take up the mantle. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's for them we are having this discussion. Based on, may good sense prevail, and science prevail. Thank you, sir. So now it's yeah. almost 10 p.m. and one of the 
primary thing regarding the geriatric health always we talk about preventive health care so who is now 40 years or 50 years or even 30 years they need to take care of themselves to have a healthy geriatric life and for that just yesterday i uh, i was called by professor roy <laughs> at 2 p 2 am uh, ist because of doing some work and also playing with my son so he told the, me or uh, reminded me regarding the importance of circadian rhythm and so that is why i am following uh, his <laughs> advice and i also request all of you as it is 10 pm we need to stop today yes. now yes. and uh, yeah. this we'll, was we'll a stop. great yeah this was a great discussion and uh, tomorrow we have another very important event and there was a slight change in the schedule and tomorrow uh, we will have Professor Dr. Harshad Devar Bhavi, who is the head of gastroenterology in the St. John's Medical College, Bangalore. And he will take a lecture on drug-induced liver injury, which is a very important uh, topic. And I hope all of you uh, will join us and give your valuable uh, feedback on that particular program. We are extremely thankful to Professor Usharani, Madam, for giving us uh, uh, her, giving us her time and uh, chair this uh, session, and we are also thankful to Professor Tripathi sir. And it was a great deliberation by Dr. Shogoto Sharkar. And also, I am very much thankful that Professor Parthoroy from Liverpool uh, had entered into the discussion and make it lively. So, uh, may I request? Inflammatory. <laughs> Inflammatory. <laughs> Thought provoking. Yeah, 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 sir. Thank you, sir. So may I request uh, Rohan to have some final words and Thanks, then we can Dr. conclude. Very good. Uh, before that, uh, Dr. Shambo. Yes, sir. Uh, because this is a National Pharmacovigilance Week celebration, we just uh, cannot uh, end it before uh, also mentioning about pharmacovigilance in the elderly. So also think of having parallel sessions or parallel programs that uh, to, to report and to generate data, drug safety data in the elderly people. I just shared two published article, okay? Yes, uh, one 2004 article, uh, international article, not from India, and another, I think, 2020 or 21 article in our uh, WhatsApp group. Yeah, I yeah. request all the people who are uh, listening to today's this thing, they can go through those two articles, and if necessary, someday we'll also discuss about pharmacovigilance in the elderly. Sir, uh, just one so point, because Dr. Yes. Uh, Dr. Proto Shahu is also there, and he is uh -huh. uh, one of your students in DM residency, and he had done his MD project on this particular topic, pharmacovigilance in elderly. So, is it? That's yeah. Right. So That's great. Uh, he had done that from SCB Medical College, so he, he is also, also there. So we hope that his thesis work will be published soon and we will be benefited from that article also. I would request Dr. Proto to do another project now. Okay. With all the newer inputs. Okay. Let us try to do another project. Fine. Thank you very much. Thank now you. over to over yeah. to Rohan. Hello. Yes, thank Rohan. You. Thank you so much for this wonderful evening. I would start by thanking Dr. Shogato Sharkar Roy, Sharkar sir, for the wonderful deliberation, which was both very informative and thought provoking. For me personally, as we have been working on a system to develop an a complete adherence kit for the elderly. It was extremely encouraging. And so were the very uh, words of wisdom by Professor Roy, uh, sir, because that's what we are trying to aim. Though still the level that which we have reduced the price has not allowed us to approach the Manik Tala public, but we are trying to make it uh, far more economically and infrastructure infrastructurally available for the Indian masses than any standard device available because the basic devices that are available, which the most accepted one being the segregated plastic box, mentioning the week and the day of the time of the day, that though being very crystal clear about the information, lacks a proper system to actually check whether the pills are being taken and a record. That is something we are trying to incorporate at a very affordable rate that can actually be accessed by masses. 
and also we are uh, trying to do it in a system where, where it is completely flexible because as we all know the pill burden varies from person to person and just one universal box i don't think does justice to this very complex problem so by saying that i won't uh, stand any more between all of you and your dinners so thank Please. you thank you everyone for being a part of this wonderful evening uh, thank you our uh, chairpersons dr tripathi and dr uh, usha pingali ma'am thank you so much our speaker dr shogoto sarkar sir uh, our uh, moderator of the evening dr shamasdar shambho samrat shamasdar and all the audience members who are still here with us i hope you will all join us tomorrow as we enter the fifth day of the seven day schedule so with that uh, uh, very high, very much thank you everyone and this program has been recorded with your permission and will be available on youtube soon so the people who have missed it tonight can access it further and hopefully it will be uh, used for a greater good thank you so much good night thank you all thank yeah. you thank you. Yeah. thank you it was very wonderful and i really enjoyed the program thank you thank you dr usha Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Hello. So, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.